Hi, everybody. This is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I'm here today with Karen Krish. She's the principal of Marion Walker Elementary School in Belafonte, Pennsylvania. Hope I said that right. <laughs> so, and uh, we're just going to dive right in. Karen, tell us a little bit about your school, the community that you serve, what kind of learning you were making happen before the pandemic. Yeah, so um, Mary Walker uh, Elementary School is part of Belfont School District. We don't, we don't get so fancy with the, the French title there. <laughs> um, and so we have about 2,800 students in our district. My elementary school has about 380 kids in it. And um, the town is near a major university, but um, our town itself is pretty small. And um, the other three elementary schools, um, one is in town and the other three are more rural. So I'm the rural one surrounded by farms and Amish. Um, so that's the, you know, plus a small town. Um, so you have all that going for you too. So um, central Pennsylvania, um, that kind of thing. And um, so we focus a lot on like responsive teaching, just like lots of schools. And um, you know the collaborative learning environment, flexible seating, all the kind of things that are kind of um, trends right now. Uh, Hands-on learning, partnership for learning, small groups. We are one-to-one -one with Chromebooks um, from K to 12, and um, our students log in the first week of kindergarten, and are all familiar with Google Classroom. Um, some grades use it more extensively than others, but kindergartners do um, at least access assignments on Google Classroom, they don't always respond to assignments, you know, or record assignments on Google Classroom, but they're familiar with it. Um, and so they don't take them home. Our high school students are allowed to take their Chromebooks home, middle school students branching out into that area, but elementary school students just use them at school. Um, we have a really strong, one of the things we're kind of known for is um, some work that I've done with um, social emotional learning um, our kids get guidance lessons every two weeks, and we focus a lot on um, social emotional learning. So we do things like, um, in addition to the guidance lessons, we're a PBIS school uh, for at least 15 plus years and have banner status on that. Um, we do mindful minutes in the morning announcements. We um, teach mindfulness directly to students um, in, in a variety of ways through guidance and also through some trained uh, facilitators in our building, including myself. And um, so we do direct teaching and practice. I do, um, every Wednesday we do before school, kids can come and do uh, mindful morning with me. And I get anywhere from 20 to 40 kids out of the 380 come and join me. And we have calm corners in our, on most of our classrooms. So that's kind of like what we're known for in trying to be equitable and uh, reach kids where they are and also understand that kids lives are busy and can be stressful and over scheduled and <laughs> all those kinds of things in our community. Sure, absolutely. Um, so then the pandemic hit and you had to go remote. So um, what were you able to carry through? What had to shift or change? So Yeah, so we were, we didn't get much notice. We were going for a like a long weekend spring break type thing and um, it correlates a bit with Penn State's, you know, spring break. And so we left on a Thursday and then we didn't come back. <laughs> um, they started shutting down the universities and then of course the schools. And so some teachers didn't have their Chrome or their um, laptops, no materials. Some of them um, didn't have access, but um, our first focus was really on that connectivity piece that, um, making sure that relationships and reassurance were happening with families. Um, families were also thrown into, you know, the, the, like everywhere else, that they were thrown into that. And um, so we really didn't focus a lot at first on the academic side and those first couple of weeks. Teachers were kind of free to do whatever they felt uh, they wanted to do. And then when Pennsylvania pulled together a plan, um, they gave us a choice between planned instruction, which is more like, you know, direct teaching, assessing those grading, those kind of things, or a review and enrichment kind of thing. And we chose review and enrichment mostly because our students don't all have access to internet in the rural areas. 
We have one school that has um, uh, a higher level of poverty and so may not have devices. Uh, sometimes the, the cell phone is the only device that people have for internet connectivity. And so we uh, also knew that we weren't prepared to put out packets, nor did we think that was the best plan for you know education. So in Richmond and Review, we, we made choice boards and they basically are each core subject area and our specials, they put out three activities a week and um, they were all review or enrichment activities. And we tried to make them so that they were, could have a technology base to them if parents had um, access to that or families had access. Or they also had to have a non-tech basis to them so that everyone could access. And we posted them on our website. Um, we mailed some home, we delivered some, we, whatever parents needed, you know, emailing, that kind of thing. We tried to reach out to them in whatever ways we could to get those to them. So we did that for, gosh, four or six weeks. And then the state decided we had to do planned instruction. And so we were kind of fielding, you know, what were some things that we could do. We were getting Chromebooks out to elementary kids and middle school kids, even though, you know, that was something we hadn't done before. <laughs> and so it was a little challenging, but um, we were able to do that and saw an increased attendance by doing that. And so we've been doing, we've kept our choice boards, but we added some required. Excuse me, teachers all along had been required to do um, two contacts per week with students. And so um, that we maintained that and some of them turned into of course Zoom lessons or Google Meets lessons because um, that was how they were, that's how we were connecting with kids. We had some um, challenges with parents, of course, being overwhelmed, families being overwhelmed. Also, we had been using a variety of parent um, re outreach apps, like, you know, Blooms or Seesaw, those kind of things. And we found out it was too much. And so we tried to consolidate that all and use only Google Classroom kinds of things because kids were familiar with that and also trying to make it a little easier on parents who had multiple children in the district. So um, so we went to plan instruction and throughout all this we're trying to do things like um, keep our lunch program going. We already had you know back weekend backpacks going on before this. We had summer lunch um, summer lunch programs going on prior to this. So we were really familiar with doing that and working with our local YMCA to do that. So those were also things that in behind the scenes we were doing as well is trying to get the planned instruction up, up to speed. Um, still challenging for our teachers and still challenging for our students, but the planned instruction it, with these choice boards and doing some required activities and some non-required activities seemed to be the best plan for our us to reach everybody and also have equity between different kinds of families. Yeah, absolutely. So Karen, as you think about sort of the big decisions that you and your leadership team have made over the last couple of months, what are a couple that seem to work pretty well? So I think the, the connectivity piece, you know, making sure that we were listening to families, that we were hearing their struggles, that we were supporting, um, you know, we were trying to provide the technology. We were trying to provide um, the resources that they needed, trying to be really responsive to what families needed. I think those were the, that's the big decision. Uh, getting the Chromebooks out was another big decision that we didn't do at first with anyone but the high school and middle school, and then found out pretty quickly that we needed to have that, um, that families were struggling with having one device in the house and four kids sharing it was not working out. <laughs> and so um, that was something that, you know, we were trying to just be really responsive was our, our big thing that we were trying to do and not overwhelm people and um, stick to our plan. So we have, we have instructional coaches in our district. And so our instructional coaches have been really central to us um, working with teachers, meeting teachers and getting the message out to teachers, working with them, and also just helping us make decisions 
um, while behind the scenes principals might be making other kinds of decisions, the, the instructional coaches were helping the teachers as well. That's been really fundamental in keeping this going. Right. So, Karen, this is usually the time when I ask about challenges and considerations moving forward, but I'd like to ask you that question within the lens of mental and emotional health, because you have such a strong background and history at your school of already focusing on that. So, mm -hmm. as I talk with schools and districts you know, around the world, everybody's worried about the trauma that students are bringing, um, that are gonna bring with them next school year, right? Um, right from the spring and from the summer. So have you all started to have some conversations about what an intake process might look like that's a little different from a normal school year and how you're gonna take mm -hmm. the initial emphasis on mental and emotional health and carry mm -hmm. that forward? Yeah, so just, you know, as an aside, we've been doing, um, between the guidance counselor and myself and a couple other folks who have a little bit stronger background in mindfulness, we've um, been, I've been guest, in, in my teacher's classrooms, you know, to do mindful minutes. Um, we've been doing some direct teaching. The guidance counselor has been doing, you know, social emotional learning is, is actually a choice board each week to make sure that we're carrying that on. Um, the other thing we're, that I've, I'm focusing on, um, twice a week I do a staff mindfulness um, session, about 15 minutes, and trying to keep our staff you know, kind of on an even keel as well. And that, and I wasn't planning to do that because I, I, I did it twice a month before um, all this. And um, they asked me if I was going to do it <laughs> while we were off. And it's like, well, I guess I am. <laughs> and so um, it's twice a week I'm doing that for staff. So we're, we have, we're putting together a task force and we're looking at those things and we haven't made, we haven't done a lot with it yet, but it's in the forefront of all of our minds that um, when we come back, we know that we, we don't jump into assessing, we don't jump into um, academics per se, we, are, we have to have a thoughtful plan so that um, they're getting, you know, kids are kind of getting back into the groove and also being allowed to kind of readjust to what's been happening and also being able to express what's been happening. And that's fundamental to our guidance program now, but I can see us beefing that up and making that um, some tr additional training for our staff, as well as for just getting back into some of the groove of those things that we were already doing, that we already have in place that kids are familiar with. Because kids, they know the lingo, they know the language, and it's across the entire elementary. And it bleeds into the middle school, not as prevalent at the high school level, but um, you know, the, we have enough people trained to do that. We also have a training coming up. We work with intermediate units in Pennsylvania right. that are kind of regional right. groups that help us with training. And so there's a um, three-day trauma-informed training coming up in the first week of June. And we have teams from every building um, attending this trauma-informed training so that we can have trainers in every building and then teams can begin to plan what that might look like when we come back because we know we had you know trauma prior to this and we know we will have trauma after this and um so and we have social workers that work in our district too and so they've been reaching out to families we've been running our student assistance teams we've also you know while we're off and we've been you know doing some things with pbis our social workers have been doing some reach out and to families as well, um, also providing resources and um, videos for parents to access resources because we know that that's um, going to be necessary. So that's a, it, it'll remain strong. And some of the things we're already doing, and add a few things. Yeah, got it. Cool. So we're kind of at the end of our time here. Anything else you want to share? Um, I don't think so. I think you know, like I said, we're moving to a task force that's gonna plan you know the cdc guidelines came out pennsylvania hasn't given us their interpretation quite yet on what that looks like so we have some folks attending a task force with our iu and our intermediate unit and um we are forming a task force within our district as soon as school is out those that task force will be kind of like full-time in in motion so that's kind of where our next steps are gotcha cool Karen, it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Thank you so much for your time and good luck with the last week and a half of school. All right, it was nice talking to you. Thanks.